that much time. But I still feel like 64K over there. Um, so I will try to speak slowly because as you see, I don't speak English very well in Spanish. I have this strong accent, so I will try to, to go slowly. Um, this is the title of my presentation. Uh, it's quite long, as you can see, rendering worlds with two triangles with ray tracing in four kilobytes on the GPU. So actually it was quite difficult to choose the title for my presentation because I had this bunch of ideas I wanted to tell you about. And I didn't really find a way to put it all together in a coherent way. So this is a bit a summary of everything I'm going to speak about. I'm going to speak about uh, procedural rendering of uh, images by just using two triangles. I'm going to speak about ray tracing and four kilobytes. So it's a bit of everything together. Um, well, um, I think before, well, do you know, have you ever seen a 4 kilobytes demo? I guess you have one, right? Yeah? Okay, still I want to show uh, a very nice intro that I like. Information is what we're trying to preserve. So I need to get. I'm not so concerned about getting him in the shop as I am getting his stuff. So, well. So this is an example of a 4K demo, so for those that don't know about it, uh, the music, animation, real-time rendering engine, uh, textures, if any, everything is inside 4096 bytes, but it's basically nothing. If you just send a mail to your friend saying, hello, how are you? That's already 4 kilobytes almost. So that's the kind of production that I'm going to speak about. Um, so, um, yeah, a bit also the motivation to speak here is because uh, in the last two or three years uh, we have we had this huge uh, improvement in the performance of the graphics cards, of the, of the GPUs. And this has been very, uh, very nice for games, very useful for games and so on, for the uh, movie industry also. Uh, but for us demo sceners, it was also incredibly nice. And it's not only because we had our demos running faster, it's basically because it allowed it, it allows us to, to experiment new techniques that we could not do before. And um, the GPUs in the last two years, they have allowed us to really to, it was like an explosion of new techniques and new ideas that we could use in our 4K demos. Um, for example, uh, we did many new things, but we also revived many of the old school effects that we were using in the software rendering era, like in DOS and so on. So we have revived voxel engines, ray tracing, and many other things. Um, uh, on top of that, uh, it, um, it happens that uh, making intros for the GPU in shaders uh, is very useful also for the size of the uh, uh, productions. So, because basically you write all your demo inside a shader, and this is text-based shaders, 
uh, they compress very well and so basically the GPU is not only allowed for big performance and new techniques but also it was a new way to compress data a lot and make very tiny production but still nice looking production. Um, so as soon as the shaders 3 model came out, all the intro folders jumped into it because shaders 2 were not flexible enough to do branching, to do many things, but shaders 3.0, it really was something that you could use in a very, uh, in, in many ways, so everyone jumped into it very quickly. So still, as an introduction to give you a bit of a context of what I'm going to speak about, the idea is to make an image on the screen or an animation, a demo, whatever, by just drawing two triangles on the screen. Uh, or one triangle, whatever. If you just need to cover the pixels of the screen with something, then you apply a pixel shader to it and you build an image inside the pixel shader. So you don't use polygons to model geometry or you don't have sprites to make particle systems. You don't really have geometry, just two triangles and then you have to build your procedural image or procedural scene animations and textures in the shader. Um, again, just to remind you, everything is inside the four kilobytes. So, uh, how much is a kilobyte actually? And that's something that we very often forget, even demo coders that are doing 64K demos or uh, huge demos, even themselves cannot really imagine how difficult or easy it is to make a 4K until they do one. So, just to give um, uh, an idea, you have this uh, page on the left of the screen that represents four kilobytes of data. That's actually the source code of the intro we saw in the beginning of the 3D object changing. So that's the, the code, the byte code of the, uh, of the demo. Uh, then on the right you have this big uh, encyclopedia of many books uh, that's, that would uh, represent 64 megabytes. That's the size of a big demo today or of a video or uh, if you go to NVIDIA site and you download a tech demo, it's around 60 megabytes, 100 megabytes, or uh, in any um, demo scene production that, that is a demo, it's also a few megabytes. So that's a bit the difference. So it's really huge, what we, uh, the, the difference between 4K and a regular production. However, this is probably not a fair comparison, because if you could somehow measure the beautifulness of a demo or uh, yeah, or a video or something, that would not really be a linear function of the amount of kilobytes you can spend on it. So just because um, a, demo, a demo is 16,000 16, times bigger, it doesn't mean it will be 16,000 times more beautiful, right? So at some point, just because you add more code, it will not look nicer. Uh, this is because of many reasons, but uh, for example, there is many uh, problems uh, in computer graphics that we cannot solve yet procedurally by algorithms or by code. So at some point you have to put textures into it so it looks nice. For example, uh, just to give an example, you have um, the holy grail of terrain uh, modeling today is to be able to, to make rivers on the mountains or making erosion. So we still don't have algorithms to make erosion and rivers. So if you want to put a river in your demo, you have to put a bitmap there. To, to, to make the shape of the river. So, not because you put more code, it will look nicer. At some point, you have to put data also. In the other hand, if you go to the tiny sizes, if you go close to the one kilobyte and four kilobyte uh, region here on the left, um, it also happens a bit the same thing. Just because a 4K intro is 16 times smaller than a 64K one, it will not look 64, uh, 16 times uh, more ugly, or it's not 16 times more difficult to actually, it's a lot more difficult to do than 16 times. So, at the same on the one kilobyte uh, region. So, I personally think that the, 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 the optimal balance between the effort you put and the amount of code you have to spend on it and the final result, the beautiness of the, the result, the, the, the perfect point is around 100 kilobytes, 150, 64 kilobytes is around there. That's the place where you, all your code really goes into beauty. So now I will, I will start with really with the, with the speech. This is the two main topics I'm going to speak about. I will make an overview of old school techniques that we are reviving today in the 4K uh, competition. And then I will uh, go into a lot more technical part of the presentation, that this second part, where I will explain techniques 
uh, and trick that I used to make one of my latest 4K production, but it was not a real-time demo, but uh, an image, actually. So, the last one thing, I, I'm all the time going to speak out 4 kilobytes, and it's not like uh, I find anything exciting on this number, 4K. It's just that I really try, uh, I really think it's a very interesting competition, because um, one of the nice things of demo scene is creativity, and uh, you can do many things that you would never do in a regular job as a game programmer or computer graphics programmer in general. Uh, there you have some standards that you have to follow, there is new, some techniques that you have to implement, but here in the demo scene we are really free to try anything we want. And the 4K category is really the place to experiment all these things because you have to experiment, otherwise you cannot put anything nice on the screen. You really have to be uh, creative and uh, have uh, some imagination to bring new techniques. So that's what I like from the 4K category. It would be as interesting as interesting if it was 8K or 10 kilobytes. Well, it's 4 kilobytes, but uh, yeah. So, <clears throat> sorry, uh, for those that, um, well, I guess most of you know how pixel shaders work. If not, basically the pixel shader is something on the graphics card that for each pixel that is drawn on the screen, uh, it allows you to uh, put there some expressions or something so that you can choose the color of that pixel. So basically for each pixel, the graphics card will give you the hand and it will tell you, okay, give me the color you want that I put in this pixel. Uh, that means that when you move code from the old school techniques to a pixel shader, uh, you can only do it for these techniques or algorithms that follow this pattern. Like for each pixel of the screen, do something. Do something can be uh, like a plasma where you choose the color of the pixel based on sinus and cosinus, or it can be um, a ray tracer or anything that follows this pattern. It doesn't work with other old school techniques like uh, where the algorithm starts with for each object. This is for each pixel, do something. But if it's the other way around, it doesn't work. For example, the old uh, star field, like this Windows screen saver, where you have the stars coming to the camera, that you cannot do it in a pixel shader. Well, you could, but it's not the, uh, the nice way to do it, the easy way, because that algorithm works like for each star, uh, move it, project it to the screen, and draw it. So it doesn't fit in a pixel shader uh, paradigm. Uh, well, you could still tr try to do these effects by using multipass techniques, uh, but that could work, but we are not interested in it, basically because it's too much code to do that, to do it uh, for a 4K, because we are all the time in the 4K context. And also it's not elegant, and uh, yeah, the simpler something is the nicer for, uh, uh, for the 4K demos. So this is... Uh, one example of an old school effect that you can do today. Uh, so basically, most probably most of you have drawn a fractal. If not, uh, the idea is that for each pixel of the screen you do some complex mathematical operations that they have something to do with uh, chaos theory and with uh, fractal geometry and finally you have a color that you have to put on that pixel of the screen. So that, that works very well on the graphics card. And actually this is the perfect example uh, to show the difference between CPU and GPU rendering, because uh, this algorithm doesn't use any texture, uh, therefore there is no bandwidth requirements. So uh, it's pure computation. There is no texture fetches. There is no bandwidth involved here. So it really makes a difference when you run this on the GPU or on the CPU. It's like 20, 30, 40 times faster to do it on the GPU than in a dual core machine. <coughs> Sorry, this is also a, a, another very, very old, old school effect. It's based on uh, deforming a texture. So it works a bit like this, as you can see here. For every pixel, uh, given the coordinates of the pixel, x and y, you compute some kind of strange formula that you, that you invent. It doesn't really matter what it is. For example, now I'm changing randomly the formula. It's really random. I didn't prepare it, so but it always looks nice. So you just evaluate any strange formula. This outputs again two values. So you input x and y on the screen. You evaluate a formula, and it outputs two values that you use to fetch into a texture, and then you put the color of the texture in the screen. So this was used um, 
uh, long ago because it's very fast because you can pre-compute this formula. So in the upper part here you have the software rendering version of the effect as it was done in the 90s and as you see it's just fetching from a lookup table and then uh, using this as uh, input for the next texture fetch. So it's really, really fast. And um, ah, well, yeah, this is another example. Um, you can do crazy things like here. I'm going to speed it up a bit. Yeah. So this is actually a rasterizer inside a pixel shader. So as you know, graphics cards are basically rasterizers. They are good at uh, rendering triangles. Now, pixel shaders are so powerful that you can implement a rasterizer inside the shader of the rasterizer. So it's a, like a meta 3D engine. And I did it yesterday, so it's not very good. Actually, you can see that the textures are moving. They are deforming because I didn't implement uh, a correction in the texture coordinates interpolation, perspe per perspective correction. But what is clear, you can uh, transform vertices, projects, and rasterize. Actually, the 3D object, the cube in this case, is stored in a texture. So the geometry is in a texture, and then you read it, you transform, project, and rasterize. It's completely useless, but well, this is demo scene, so we do useless things all the time. <laughs> yeah, as I was saying, it, that, most of the techniques don't really apply to games or anything. We don't care that they are practical. We just have the fun doing it. You can implement uh, metaballs, plasmas, anything you want of, of the old effects. And it's amazing how fast it is. For those that were programming it in the old days and still remember the frame rates, when moving it to the GPU, it's like, wow, that's incredibly fast. You can do ray tracing, of course. Uh, this is one of the, uh, how to say, <laughs> well, this is one of the things that you most often see in the demo scene, at least before, where we could see many, many ray tracing demos and uh, intros. Uh, well, it's true that in the demo scene we have done a lot of ray tracing, but we have never done real ray tracing. And by real, I mean rendering something else than spheres and planes, but well, um, yeah, so this one on the left actually is a one kilobyte uh, intro. Just one kilobyte, let me show the, the code. The one on the right is a 4K intro I made, or a demo, that uh, it was actually a test for Pixar Shader 3. And uh, yeah, it was actually my first shader. So if there is any code there here, maybe you have seen this already. This is this code here, it's OpenGL code. It's, responsible for making this image on the left, the brown one, chocolate. Um, <clears throat> so this is all you need to make that effect. Uh, this includes opening a window on the desktop, uh, putting the desktop into full screen mode, initializing OpenGL, creating the shader, running it, and so on and so on. So actually, there is two columns. The one on the left is the shader, this part here. The rest, everything on the right, is just to set up OpenGL and, uh, um, and so on. So this guy is old. He's uh, living in Poland. It was very kind from him. Uh, it was very kind because he, yeah, he, he, he made the source code open, which is not very uh, usual in the demo scene. We normally try to hide the code, not because we don't want people to use our secrets, but it's basically because normally code is so ugly that it's embarrassing to show it. But this guy is still he. He, he, he placed the code there and many people is learning from it, so it's very nice. Actually, I took the code to be able to, to put his rendering into my, my slides. Um, you can also do not only ray tracing, but path tracing. For those, that, uh, for those that don't know it, this is a technique. It's a bit of uh, an, an evolution of ray tracing where you use many, many rays uh, to inspect the 3D setup of your scene. And this allows you to make more complex shading than the usual uh, ray tracer. So here in the ray tracer, here on the left, on the right, sorry, you have some reflections and shadows, but they are very sharp. Like uh, you can actually see the pixels between the shallow and not shallow part. And the reflections are very sh sharp, like uh, perfect mirrors. While with path tracing, you cast many, many rays. It's, uh, the technique is called Monte Carlo integration. And this allows basically for soft shadows, uh, fuzzy reflections or diffuse reflections, uh, even global illumination and so on. So these are two examples also of um, path tracing in the demo scene. These are not real-time, these are 
well, almost real time, but still not real time. These are uh, procedural images. It's a new competition we have in the demo scene because traditionally we have been doing a lot of real time rendering, but uh, we have discovered that it's also very nice and interesting to do non real time rendering. And these were two examples that. Uh, Actually, the one on the left was second position on Breakpoint in Germany this year, and the one on the right, I think, was second position also in Wensley in Switzerland just a few weeks ago. Uh, still, they don't use global illumination, but you can see the soft shadows and all these things. Of course, it's a lot slower because here you only have to cast one, two, three rays per pixel, while here you are casting uh, hundreds of rays per pixel. But still, you see on the demo scene, we always use spheres, ellipsoids, planes, cylinders, parabolas, boxes, very, very simple shapes. And for some reason, demo sceners, we have never been attracted by real ray tracing. So this is the screenshot of my actual job. This is what I do. I do ray tracing in my job of huge models. This is like 100, 200, 300 million polygons, really huge models. But in the demo scene, we never feel, we have never been attracted by this. And it's really a pity. I would like to encourage everyone to go into real ray tracing beyond spheres and planes. So this is a few screenshots showing ambient occlusion. This is actually running on CPU. It's running on 16 cores or 32 cores. I don't remember now. And uh, it's quite fast. Now the question is, this is a bit off, uh, off topic, but um, why not to move ray tracing into the GPU? Real ray tracing, I mean, something like this, like polygon, not the spheres. And there is few reasons why uh, ray tracing has not been moved to the GPU yet, even if it's a very hot research topic. Um, the main reason is that uh, to do fast ray tracing, you need op trees or KD trees or uh, bonding volume hierarchies or some sort of acceleration structure. And accessing this acceleration structure is quite random or incoherent. It doesn't very well fit on the uh, way graphics cards are built. Graphics cards are built, are built so that when you access memory, you do it in squares, like in a 2D texture. And this doesn't fit at all with real ray tracing. So that's perhaps a reason not to, to have today yet GPU ray tracing. The other reason is that you need a stack to be able to traverse uh, recursively one of these acceleration structures. And you don't have a stack on the shaders. The day we have a stack on the shaders, things will explode, uh, demo scene included. It will be like the new big step for demo singers. First was pixel shader 3, the next one will be having a stack on the shader. A, low, a lot of effects will be possible, finally. And uh, the other problem is that you don't have much video memory today on the graphics cards. You have one gigabyte, one gigabyte and a half at most, and that's not enough for most of the real 3D models as well. Um, so, yeah, we are not doing real ray tracing, but we are doing um, something else on the demo scene today in the 4K, and that's what I'm going to speak about on the rest of, the, my, of my presentation, and that's ray marching. Uh, again, for those that don't know it, in few words, ray marching is a variation of ray tracing, meaning it's a way to inspect the 3D scene. Um, it's based on, well, normally on computer graphics, the main problem to solve is that it's like, you are, a, you are in a given point in 3D, you are looking in a given direction, and you want to know what's there in the 3D scene in that direction. So basically that's ray casting, it's casting a 3D ray, a 3D line from your position to the direction of interest and finding what's there, what's the object there, what's the color or the shadow in that part of the scene. And normally you can do that by uh, mathematically solving the problem. If you are working with spheres, plan, uh, planes, polygons, you can really solve some equations that tell you, yes, there is something here in this direction, or there is nothing there. But for those objects that are not simple, that are not made of polygons, and that therefore don't have a mathematical formula, uh, you have to use this technique for those objects. And it's very simple in conception, it's really, really simple to understand and to implement, and it's incredibly powerful because you can render anything you want with it. So in this case, you have this strange shape here, it's not a sphere, it's not a box, it's something complex, probably without a mathematical representation. Yet you can take your starting point, uh, the one in red on the left, take the direction you are interested in, and slowly advance in space and test 
uh, and do the stupid test like when you are in the car and you ask your father, your parents, are we there already? Did, did we arrive to the destination? Yes or no? So you do the same thing. You start going slowly until you hit something. So at each sampling point, at each red circle, you ask the 3D object, okay, did I hit you? I am inside you, yes or no? And if not, you continue to the next step until you, fit, uh, until you hit something. So it's really, it's really, really simple. It's just a for loop and a test. And that allows you to render anything you want. Problem is it's very slow. So that's where GPU comes into, into the game, because GPUs are very fast. So again, what can you raymarch? Anything you want. You can raymarch uh, hate fields or terrains or 2.5 uh, dimension objects, as they call it also. You can uh, raymarch volume textures, so 3D textures with uh, one and zero saying solid or not solid object, so object or not object. You can raymarch procedural isosurfaces like metaballs or anything you want, or analytic surfaces. So actually, I have one example of each here. The one on the right is a Tracy. You probably know it. It's a 1K intro. Uh, the coder is sitting there. He will speak about it probably today or next day. So I don't know when. So this is a height map. It's just a texture, gray scale texture that uh, tells you the height of the mountains at each point in the base plane. So you can raymarch that. The one on the bottom left is a 3D texture. It's a 256 by 256 times 256 uh, texture. And the texels or the voxels contain one or zero uh, saying there is an object here or there is not. And then you can raymarch it, raymarch it by just advancing on the ray through the 3D volume. And when you hit a texel, you stop and you put the color of that voxel. Uh, you can also raymarch uh, procedural surfaces, like uh, the one, the yellowish one on the center in the bottom part, that's Tracy, it's also a 1K uh, intro, but by the same programmer. And the surface uh, is made by just some strange formula, like a sinus times something divided by something, and that uh, gives you a kind of potential and you can find where the potential takes a given value and that makes an ISO surface or a surface and you can raymarch that. Uh, actually, I'm going to show it. Do you care if I show it? <laughs> yeah, because I have been speaking a lot, so it's time for them. And then we continue. Uh, that guy. Yeah. <laughs> I think I need some help. <laughs> You want to talk about it? <laughs> Only talk? Oh. No, no. I mean, what's the problem? Uh, problem is I should see my desktop on the big screen. That is your desktop. No, I don't have Windows XP. It's Vista. That's an XP thing. <laughs> <laughs> it was worth a try. <laughs> There should be some sound on this. Well, anyway. So, yeah, this is... Um, Did you plug in the sound? Yeah, should be plugged. And, ah, there it is.
Yeah, so that was one kilobyte. And if you think about it, just one of these icons you have on your desktop, 32 pixels by 32 pixels, is already four kilobytes, three kilobytes. And this was one kilobyte, and it was covering the complete screen with an animation, sound, very nice colors and shapes. So it's, it's really amazing. Um, yeah, so you can ray mark ISO surfaces or analytic surfaces, like the 3D fractal I showed in the beginning. Um, then you have many, many ways to really do this ray marching process. So you can do it in a stupid way, meaning the way I explained before, just stepping slowly on the ray, detection of the ray until you hit something. But you have a bit more uh, complex or elaborated ways to do it, like uh, uh, finding, well, you can re, uh, you can, um, yeah, recast all this problem into a uh, function root finder problem that is something with mathematics, but well, you have many ways to do it, like the section and Newton Raphson uh, mechanisms. And then you have another uh, way to do it, and it's called, I don't know how it's called, I call it like this distant fields. And that's actually the one I used for um, that 4K demo on the right Kinder Neuser. And that's um, what I'm going to speak about now on the second part of the presentation that's a bit more technical. So it's rendering with distance. Uh, distance fields. And I'm going to take this image as an example. This is um, an image I made for Euskal Party. This is a big party in Spain. Uh, you are all invited to, to go there. It's actually a really huge thing, like uh, five, six thousand people there. It's more of a LAN party today, but it was a demo scene party as well. I showed, uh, I showed, showed it there. I got first uh, place, and it was on the 4K graphics um, competition, so meaning you have four kilobytes to show an image on the screen. And it was based on ray marching. I did it first on the CPU, then I moved it to the GPU, and I will explain a bit the differences and the advantages to move it up, uh, to the GPU. So, as you can see, it's not, uh, it's not trivial geometry, it's not like spheres and planes, you have some more organic shapes, at least, like this monster in the middle that is, uh, yeah, it's quite organic. It's not very simple to say if it's done spheres or cylinders or what, something a bit more complex. Then you have uh, not photorealistic uh, lighting, but you have some advanced shading techniques like ambient occlusion or soft shadow, so it's not super complex, but you have a bit of nice techniques, so I will explain a bit how it's done. Um, so, of course, I was not inventing anything new myself. I got uh, many inspiration from many places. Um, this is the two main, well actually I discovered one of them after I did the graphics, but well, still I put them here as a reference because you can have a look to them to learn a bit more. So there is two works uh, that were done before that were using similar techniques. The first one was done in 1989 uh, uh, by a guy called uh, Sam Dean. Uh, this guy was a genius, he was inventing also many virtual reality devices and stuff like this. And he first used it for rendering 3D fractals. Um, in fact, the way I was rendering my Kinder Neuser demo with the 3D fractal, then I discovered it's almost, if not exactly the same thing. Then you also have these uh, guys uh, that made this article for GPU Gens 2, and they were using similar techniques for rendering some parallax mapping effects or uh, relief mapping effects, something like that. So you can go to this article and have a look to it because it's very, very similar. So basically the trick is to do the ray march, but um, to speed it up by having some extra information. Like normally you just know if you are inside or not the object. That's the way to do regular ray marching. But if you not only know the, if you are inside or not, but if you, only, if you also knew the distance to which you are from the object, then you could really speed up the ray marching process. And basically the rendering with distance, field, distance fields, it's all about uh, knowing the distance to any object on the scene from any point on space. So this is the idea. So you have the objects, your 3D scene in black, you have your camera or your point of interest in blue, and you have a line that represents the direction you are interested in, the, the direction you want to know if there is anything there or if there is any color or whatever. So um, what you do is to take the blue point and somehow compute the distance to the closest object on the scene. So the distance, the closest object in this case is this pillar, this capsule here, 
on the bottom part of the image and the red line represents the distance from the blue point to the black object. There you know that there is nothing around you uh, closer than that distance. So that means that you could actually walk in any direction you want that distance before you hit anything. You, could, you, you can safely walk all that distance and you know you will not hit anything because the closest object is at that distance. So that means that you can advance in any direction but also in the direction you are uh, looking to in the direction of the ray. So that means you can jump up to the second blue point being safe that you didn't hit anything. If this was, if this was regular ray marching, you would have needed, uh, I don't know, 100, 20, 50 steps before you reach the blue point. But here you can really go in one single step up to that point. But that's because you have the information of the distance. So next thing to do is to repeat the process. You, you are at the second blue point, you again query to the scene, okay, what's the closest object to me? And then the closest object is that one, and you have again in, red, in a red line the distance to that object, therefore you can walk in a sphere around you all that amount of meters or centimeters before you hit anything, and thus you go to the third blue point. And this you can repeat three, four, five, six times, whatever you need before you hit the object. So you actually arrive to the destination point in let's say 10, uh, 12 steps instead of thousands or hundreds. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, the advantages of using this technique is that it's uh, really much faster. It's very simple to do, to program. It's almost as simple as the brute force ray marching, provided you have a way to know the distance to the closest object, of course. But let's say you have a magic function that tells you for this point in space XYZ, the distance to the closest object is this amount. If you have such a function, implementing the ray marks is really, really, really simple. It's perfect for 4K or 1K uh, demos. Um, of course, you can use many, many optimizations here. Uh, if you do it in the uh, naive way, in the simple way, it's uh, as I just described on the previous uh, slides, but uh, you can do some shortcuts, like you can afford to have some errors, errors on your um, distance estimations and on your intersection point, basically. So, for example, if you allow, if you have a tolerance of five uh, inches, and you say, okay, I want to find the intersection, but I don't care if it's very exact. I, I can accept up to five inches of error, or uh, yeah. So then, if you if, if you allow for this, then uh, you can take bigger steps. Now, the thing is that the farther you are from the blue original blue point, the farther you are doing your calculations, uh, the smaller things will become on the screen, right? So in 3D, something when it's very far, it's smaller on the screen. So that means that um, real world errors, like the five inches, will have less impact when you are doing the error far away from the camera than when you are doing it close to the camera. Then, uh, when doing this ray marching, you can take bigger steps, uh, quite bigger steps than you should when you are from, far from the camera. Um, basically, because the objects in the screen space, they become smaller uh, with a mathematical relation, like it's like one divided by distance. That means that you can make your error proportional to the distance you are uh, something. So if you are something at five meters, you can do it. Your error can be two times bigger if you are something, something at two meters. Um, because one compensates the other, so the projection, the perspective correction compensates with the error you are making. So this is a very nice um, trick and a very nice optimization you can uh, use. Uh, of course, as any technique, there is also some problems with it. And the main problem is that the technique becomes very slow when you are not hitting objects, but you are passing through very, like, when you are passing very close to an object. Because let's say, let's imagine you have a pillar and you are casting a ray that doesn't hit the pillar, but it just goes like at one inch from the pillar. So at some point, the ray, the ray marching process, process goes very close to the pillar, so it knows there is something around, so you know that there is a pillar like at one inch distance, so it advances one inch, but still doesn't hit it, because it's going parallel to the column. So um, this happens again because it goes parallel, so when you advance one inch, you are still at one inch from the pillar, and so on and so on. And this happens many times until you really escape from the neighborhood of the pillar, and then the ray marching again accelerates a lot. So, 
hopefully, uh, hopefully you will not have many such pixels on the screen. You will not have many places where this happens. Um, uh, actually, this graphics, this image here on the right is showing this uh, problem. So you have the scene again, the, the graphics, and in colors you have the amount of steps I had to take on the ray marching process before I hit any surface. So bluish colors are very fast pixels to compute because you only give uh, five, six steps. Uh, green are a bit more complex pixels, and red are the really, really slow pixels to compute because you have to give up to 64 steps. You have to take up to 64 steps before you hit anything. And so, as expected, you have many green parts, but you can see. Uh, well, I don't know if you can see it actually, but here in the edges on the borders of the objects. It's like you have a very big increase on the amount of steps you have to take. It also happens on the columns. And it's because of this problem of really going closer to an object, but in a parallel way, not really hitting it. So, but again, the amount of pixels you have is like 5% of the screen space pixels, so it's not very bad. Even if they are very slow, they don't really consume that much. So if anyone is going to implement this technique, I added some numbers as a guide or, well, just to share a bit my experience with, with this technique. And these numbers um, tell you, like, for example, I needed 50 million um, queries to the distance field function before I could uh, render the image. So uh, if it was a 3D volume, you would be accessing this 3D texture 50 million times for this image. In my case, it was not a 3D texture, it was really a math function but I have to evaluate it 50 million times. Um, and 60% of these evaluations were used for the primary rays, basically to know which surface you are, uh, it's visible for each pixel. Because as you probably know, if you are going to do shading, like I mean, occlusion or shadows, you also have to cast new rays, or basically you need to query the 3D scene information. But still, 60% of the queries were done really just for the basic diffuse shaded image. Um, and this is actually quite interesting because most often when you have uh, highly detailed shading or photorealistic shading, it's quite the opposite. You normally uh, can render very quickly the primary rays, the primary rays or the basic image, and then it takes long to compute the global illumination, the indirect lighting or the shadows or whatever. But with this technique, it's, uh, with this technique, it's the opposite, and that's very, very interesting. And I will explain why in the next slides. So basically, for all this to work, um, you need a distance field, right? So <clears throat> as I was saying before, you can do it in many ways, with a volume, with a texture, or with analytic uh, mathematical representation of your volume, whatever. So this has been done in, in the past. But in 4K, you cannot afford to fill a 3D texture with data or anything. So what I did instead is to think, okay, what if I just define my distance field procedurally, directly? And so that's what I did. But I, I want, I, I want to, uh, to make a point here, and that's that I didn't procedurally create the scene and then compute a distance field for it. Instead, I directly created the distance field and the 3D surface, the 3D geometry, was a consequence, a consequence of my distance field. So it's not like I made first the geometry and then somehow computed the distance field. It was quite the opposite. Uh, that's very, very interesting. Uh, it's something I never did before, and it uh, turned out to be very fun. And well, as anything, as everything in procedural, uh, in procedural content creation, in the beginning you don't know what you are doing. You just place there formulas or expressions or whatever and just something appears on the screen but after a bit of time you really master the thing and you know what you have to type to get a given surface. But it's more complex than when you just do procedural modeling. When you are procedurally modeling something, you, if you want a shape of a circle, you type the equation of the circle. But this is different because this is indirect creation of geometry. We are not modeling, modeling the geometry but the distance to the geometry. So it's like working in in another layer, so it's a bit more difficult. But finally, you, you can manage it and do and do something interesting. Of course, it's not really that difficult because there is many techniques that you can use, as these ones that are listed here that I will explain now. 
like uh, you can combine distance fields together, so if you make an object somehow with the distance, distance field and you make another object, you can combine them together into a single function. You can also repeat objects in any direction you want as many times as you want. You can deform, deform or change the shape of the objects, like twisting or bend, uh, bending. You can add uh, surface details very easily and so on and so on. So I'm going to explain a bit these examples. So the most easy way of working is to combine small shapes. So let's say you somehow find a way to represent the distance to a box, and then you can take many of these distance boxes and combine them together to give a resulting distance field. Of course, the way to combine them is by using the mean function. So if you have an object here and an object here and you are here, the distance to the closest object is the minimum of the two distances. So the closest object is the one that has more influence, of course. So once you have one, two, three, ten boxes, you can combine them together in a mean function to get your column or your pillar. Um, so again, you can combine many pillars together by doing the minimum of each one. So in this case, it's four pillars, and you can pack them together into one function that is called four magic columns or something. So next step is uh, to repeat these columns all over the space. That's something I wanted to do. I wanted to make a graphics that didn't have any boundaries. So I needed to repeat this geometry all over the plane or the space. And the way to do it is very easy. So <clears throat> in a regular way of doing computer graphics, like uh, rasterization or ray tracing, what you should do to have many objects on the screen is to repeat many times the object or instantiate the object many times. That means consuming more memory or consuming more rasterization time or bigger KD trees for ray tracing, whatever. The nice thing on this technique is that you don't really need to add anything. You just have to change the input to your function. So the input is x, y, c, of course. It's the point on space. Now, if you want your function to be repeated, if you want to, your function to become periodic, you just have to make your input periodic. So you use a mod operation. This is a math operation that is kind of making something like that, that goes from 0 to 1, and then again from 0 to 1, and then again from 0 to 1. If you modify your input like this, then your columns will be there, and then again, and then again, and again, 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 as many times as you want, actually infinite amount of time. Uh, of times. And I don't have infinite amount of memory or infinite amount of render time. It's just changing the input. So that's very, very useful. Um, yeah, you can also distort the image, and I'm saying distorting the image and not distorting the objects because there is no objects here, it's just distances. And I don't distort objects, but the inputs. Actually, if you want to deform an object, what you have to do is to deform in the inverse way the input to the function. You have to do the inverse transformation to your input. And then you will have on the screen the transformed object. So in this case, for example, I have XYZ as input, or P, and I can apply a 2D rotation to the input, actually the inverse of a 3D rotation to the input based on the altitude or the height of the point, and that makes that basically deforms the domain of the function, not the result, but the domain, the input. So it just deforms the space and everything that is inside space, and the 3D object is inside the space, in the volume, so it's really deforming the space, not really the object. So this is a more practical example that I used for making that monster I had in the image. Um, the basic idea was a combination of instantiation, deformation, and blending of shapes. So in the beginning, I had just one cylinder. Uh, actually, it was the one on the, on the right uh, on the floor that was representing the x-axis of the, of the volume. Now I could instantiate it six times by using the mean operation again to combine different shapes and pre-deforming space for each one in a different way. Actually, it was a rotation of 60 degrees. So when you deform space for each one and you combine them with a mean, you have six times the x-axis rotated. Next, you can deform space also by uh, compressing vertically your volume or space based on the distance to the center of the object. So the closer you are to the center, the, the more compressed or the, well, you actually add an offset to your volume. So it's like if you had space and it was a regular grid, it's like everything goes vertically 
uh, when you go closer to the center of the object. And that, because deforms everything, the object inside is deformed also like that. Yeah, so again, this was not looking very organic, and like anything that has to look organic in computer graphics, uh, I needed a Perlin noise or some random or pseudo-random function. So I used a Perlin noise because, as you know, that's very useful to make uh, yeah, natural looking objects or organic shapes. So the idea was to deform, well, actually to change a bit the rotation angle of each of these axes uh, with a noise function. So the noise function must be different for each leg, so they don't all look the same. And also, uh, I wanted the, the, the legs to do this kind of sinus waves in a random way. So the noise function, it also depends on the distance to the center of the object. Actually, it's a 2D burning noise. There is a mistake there, a typo. typo. It should not be VEC3, but VEC2 as well. Um, of course, burning noise is very slow to compute. Um, that's the problem with this technique, because uh, as soon as you start making the formulas and the expressions more and more complex, it starts to be slower and slower. But well, GPUs are quite fast, so it's not that bad. Um, another technique you can use is to blend shapes. Uh, doing this in geometry, if you were really working with objects, this would be a nightmare. You would need marching cubes, or I don't know what. It would be really complex to take a polymesh, a second polymesh, and somehow blend them together, make good connections between the triangles, have a small, smooth surface and with correct normals, it would really be a nightmare. Uh, instead, however, with this technique, it's really, really simple. You just have the two shapes you want to blend, so I had in the top one a distance to a ball or a distance to a, to a point, that makes a sphere, Then you have the tentacles that we had before, so that's this one and this two on that code there on the right, and you just blend both distances into a single distance, and you do the blending based on how far you are from the center of the object. So when you are close to the center, then it's the sphere that has more influence. When you are far away, it's more the tentacles that drive the final distance value. Um, of course, to have this blending, um, well, to control a bit the way the blending happens, uh, I used a smooth step function, you pro probably know it, just a function that takes this shape. And what well, basically it allows you to control the range of values of the input, uh, yeah, well, I mean the range of values. Basically it, it allows you to say, okay, from this distance to this distance, and not the other one, but this distance, it will be the sphere that has more influence, and from here to here, it will be the, the tentacles. So you can't really uh, control where the blending happens. And it's important to use a smooth step function and not just a linear function because some math uh, features of this function, like the smooth step function is a cubic function with zero derivatives on the sides. And well, that basically means that when you sh blend both shapes, you don't have a discontinuity on the normals of the surface. So the really, it's really smooth up to the second derivative. So that's important. But smooth step, it comes for free on uh, most GPU languages like GLSL and HLSL, so that's not a problem. And the last technique you can use here without going to the troubles of processing geometry and without having to, to do very complex things is to add uh, details to your surface. Like this was the basic shapes of the pillars and I wanted to give them the look of an old um, corrupted pillar, right? So um, you take the distance to the pillar and you just add some noise, spurling noise. And that already makes some holes. So there is no Boolean operations going on here. There is no com uh, complete, uh, yeah, what, what is this technique used in ray tracing in GSM? I, I don't know how it's called. Well, you don't have to do any Boolean operations on mathematical shapes or in polygons. You just add some noise function. So actually it's a bit more complex, the FBM function. That it stands for fractional Brownian motion. It's a fractal sum of Perlin noises. You have probably used it if you have made 3D mountains or any kind of procedural image. So you have one Perlin noise, you add a second Perlin noise with less influence, but twice the frequency, and so on and so on. So this is done with four Perlin noises. And then what is interesting is the clamp function there. So the FBM function, uh, it takes value from minus one to one. 
in a, and if I would directly apply the FDM to the distance to the pillars, then I would have both holes into the pillar as uh, stuff going out of the pillar. Right? So I only wanted to make holes and nothing go out from the surface. So I had to clamp so that all values were from 0 to 1, meaning positive values only going inside. But you see, it's just one line of code, and then you add a lot of detail to your object size. It's really, really simple. You don't have to, to do anything strange. So once you have your geometry or your surface, it's time to do some lighting into it to give it the feeling of depth and to bring some uh, interesting colors to the image. So the first you need to, to do lighting, to do any kind of lighting, is to have a normal, and then you can do wood mapping into it or shadows or whatever. So well, computing the normal is very, very easy. You have done it probably uh, in the past if you have used matching cubes or fractals or, or anything. And it's, uh, the technique is very well known. It's called central differences. It means you are in a given point in space where you hit the surface, so you are in the surface, and you want to know where is the normal to the surface. So what's, what's the orientation of this surface? So you can apply it to the lighting equations and so on and so on. Because, yeah. um, so the way to do it is uh, basically to query, again, what's going on around me. So I'm the point that they want to compute the normal for, and to know what I'm looking to, what I am oriented to, I have to fetch some information from all around me. So like I look to my right and I say, okay, is there anything here? Is there a surface? Yes or no? Or, okay, yes, there is a surface at one meter. And what's on my left? There is a surface at 10 meters from me at the, in this point. So that means basically that, that this is far from the surface, this is close, so basically the surface, the surface should be like that, meaning the normal will point there. So you do this for x, y, and c, and you can uh, extract a normal that tells you the, yeah, the orientation of the, of the surface. So that's very uh, that's represented in this code here, uh, where it says the gradient of a function at a point p is just um, a 3D vector that you normalize, and the components of this 3D vector are computed by, as you see, fetching this distance information a bit to the left and to the right. That's the, this little vector here. Oops. This vector here is uh, an offset to the right. The other one is an offset to the left. It's a very small value. And then you compute the, the normal. So this is an approximation to the gradient or to the derivatives of the function. Well, whatever. Um, yeah, then you can do bump mapping into it.